Hello, and thank you for joining us for another episode of Hope for Healthcare with Dr. Katie Cole in partnership with ICD Healthcare Network. Dr. Katie Cole is a holistic physician, organizational well being consultant, and change agent, working with industry leaders and in proven strategies to heal our national healthcare system and our culture of medicine. Stay tuned to hear today's speaker. Well, welcome everyone to Hope for Healthcare podcast. Today, I have a guest with us. Her name is Dr. Terry Malcolm, and she is an executive physician coach and very zealous in her belief regarding culturally competent and exceptional experience in clinical care, that the humane experience is achievable through meaningful and authentic relationships with others, and a commitment to elevating physicians of color and empowering them to thrive as they lead. Dr. Malcolm is also the System Vice President of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging for Dartmouth Health, and is a current board member of the American Association of Physician Leadership. Dr. Malcolm is a certified physician executive, as well as an ICF certified coach. Her coaching philosophy that she created called the Malcolm Method is rooted in the principles of inclusive and strength-based leadership, social and emotional intelligence, positive psychology, and supportive accountability. Well, welcome, Terry. I am so glad and thankful to have you on our podcast today. Thank you, Katie. It's really a pleasure to be here. Yes. Well, Terry, I know we've had several discussions up until today, and you know, I really want to start off by hearing more about your own story and how you became interested in developing an evidence-based leadership coaching program for physicians. Wow. Let's see. How far back do you want me to go? <laughs> you no, know, as far back as you want. <laughs> this is about um, you. So, oh, well, well, thank you. You know, I can, I can start all, all the way. I, I remember I was once asked to introduce myself by starting with, um, I was born in, so I won't go all the way back to <laughs> the very, very early days of, of my life, but I, I will just share a little bit. My background as a physician is as an obstetrician and, and gynecologist. And I was really drawn to obstetrics and gynecology because I love the diversity of the subspecialty and that, and being able to really help women be healthy at all phases of their reproductive life. And as I moved out of residency, you know, into attending hood and was a full-time attending, then I be really became very drawn to leadership. And, and I was so drawn to the leadership aspect of medicine because I realized that that's really where the decisions were being made. The decisions were being made that were directly impacting how we as frontline physicians were delivering care. Mm -hmm. And I, I felt that our voice was not always being included. So just our voice as physicians was not always being included in, in that decision-making. And I also felt that um, my voice as a woman and as a woman of color, as someone who identifies as a black African-American female physician, that my voice wasn't always in, included. And it, the, the decisions, the, some of the goals, some of the initiatives were really not inclusive of how we as physicians not only deliver care, but really how it impacts our patients and how it can improve the care that, that we're delivering. So if we're really looking at trying to achieve health equity, then how do we need to look at our goals, our initiatives, the processes that we have through a different lens? And so that's really what, what led me to start pursuing leadership as, as a physician. And, and then I, I think when I moved into leadership roles and, um, you know, leadership roles with increasing scope, increasing uh, responsibility, I, I can recall being appointed to, um, as you know, the C-suite of, of a hospital and just how exciting it was that the entire makeup was of women like this, you know, I just thought this is such a she raw moment, you know, like <laughs> this is so cool. It and, and very it was unusual to see something very like that. unusual. Exactly. You know, you just, yeah. it's, that's so, that's so rare 
you, know, you think about the number of of women, especially in academia, that are in those key positions like deans, like vice deans, and just how low those numbers are. And so I just thought, this is such a monumental moment. And I really felt such great pride. And at the same time, I was disheartened. Mm -hmm. And I was disheartened by the fact that as I looked around as at all of us, I was the only woman of color. And oh. that I was the only Black woman who was part of this just dynamic team, dynamic team. But I'm thinking about how many more dynamic individuals there are, how many more just phenomenal, extremely talented physicians, physicians of color, female physicians of color who, um, who have not been afforded the same opportunity, mm. who have, who have been, sometimes intentionally, maybe unintentionally been blocked from their career advancement, from their voices being heard, who have been muted, who have been dismissed. And I just thought this, this, there has to be a way to change this, right? There has to be a way for more people to have their voices heard and to be part of this conversation and ultimately to be part of this decision-making because the more diverse that we are and the more that we activate that, that diversity. So really bringing forth all of that potential that exists within us, then the better off we are and the better that we can do in achieving those goals, but also just improving the care, right? Taking better care of, of our patients and ultimately getting to that point of health equity. Not that that's a final endpoint, but we can really start to move the, the needle on that. So I think, you know, that's really what has drawn me to uh, to be so impassioned, kind of as you said earlier, and as conversations we've had about this before, about like yeah. what brings you to this work, you know, it's those moments. It's those moments when when you realize there's there's so much more that we can do. Well, so that's definitely your why, Terry. And thank you for sharing that. I know this is such a kind of a sensitive subject, and um, I really appreciate you you know, really being authentic and vulnerable with our audience today and, and sharing your own experience. And I just want to, you know, thank you for having such an empowering perspective and using those experiences to create something beautiful. And you've created this amazing coaching program for physicians. Can you tell us a little bit more about this and, and how you focus on inclusive leadership? Sure. Okay. Yeah, I think, you know, coaching is one of those aspects that I did not get introduced to until I moved into a leadership role. And it's just, I think one of the modalities that has opened me up so much more, it has really helped me to develop a, I think really start to shift from a fixed mindset to a growth mindset. And, and I think another level is going to more of an inclusive mindset as well. So right. coaching made such a tremendous, like literally life-changing um, difference for me that I said, well, this is something I want to be able to share with my colleagues that I, I, I absolutely have, have struggled with, mm -hmm. um, you know, with self-confidence, I've struggled with doubt. I've struggled with having difficult, challenging conversations with others. I've struggled with, you know, sometimes moving beyond the the setbacks and, and coaching really helped me to see things through such a different perspective that I said, I want to be able to bring this to my, my colleagues as well. And I think being, being a physician just helped with an immediate connection. It mm -hmm. just really helped to remove any barriers around what is this, you know, is this punitive? Is this going, is this, is this remediation, you know, but no, this is really a partnership. This is truly a partnership of where we are going to co-create. Right? We're going to co-create an action plan that is totally um, coachy or client centered. So everything that we're going to talk about and everything that we're going to discuss is around you and where you want to go with your career or where you want to go with, um, with this next phase of your life or whatever challenge or issue you might be, you might be dealing with. And so the, 
in becoming a coach and really starting to, to build that coaching muscle, then I said, so what is it important for our, our physicians to really learn about right now? What is, what is top of mind for them? What are they, what are they asking for? We, we know that they're, we're already some of the most resilient individuals right? that, yes. that, that exist right now, our ability to overcome challenges and, and setbacks is, is just tremendous. Mm-hmm. At the same time, how do we do so in a really healthy way, right? How do we do so in a way that actually elevates us to another, another level? And we're not having to sacrifice everything else in order to overcome this challenge. So, you know, it was really looking at how do we take care of ourselves? It was most certainly looking at giving and receiving feedback, right? It Mm -hmm. was, um, you know, it was, you know, another emphasis just around, yes, um, resiliency, but also around emotional intelligence and empathy, right? Mm -hmm. How do we even, how are we more empathic in situations where empathy is the last thing that we even want to bring to the conversation, but how can we, how can we still view this, view this scenario through, through a very, um, empathic lens. And, and so it was just really listening to what was important to our physician community right now with an emphasis being around, I think, female physicians and, and and also really female physicians of, of color too, and, and addressing what are some of the concerns that you're having every day when Mm -hmm. you, when you go into work and that you're feeling like I have to leave a part of myself at home in order for me to be successful in, in the workplace here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I, when I think about asking any, anyone in a, in a leadership position, Mm -hmm. would you want your employee to come to work and only bring 70% of themselves to work? I I think the answer would be no. Mm -hmm. I strongly believe that the answer would be no, of course. I want you to bring all of yourself to work. You can, right. If you can bring all of yourself to work, then you're going to really like unleash that potential that exists, right? You're going to be able to make faster decisions. You're going to be able to collaborate with individuals, you know, easier. You're going to find communication flows more seamlessly. Well, and you know, Terry, we, we had a really interesting conversation around that for even women who let's say just had a baby and they come back to work within a couple of weeks and they're trying to pump and they're having to use their own RVUs. You're giving up RVUs to pump. And we talked about how like a part of that woman is actually home with her, her child and her family. And so worried about missing RVUs and productivity that she's not even really present during the day. And I really feel like that applies to everyone. I mean, if we cannot show up and have psychological safety in our own work environment on the front line, especially, and we are leaving a part of ourselves at home because we don't have that psychological safety, you're right. Then it's sometimes less than even 50% of us is showing up. And when we talk about emotional intelligence, it's hard to incorporate that when you don't have psychological safety. That's so true, Katie. Yeah. You're you're so fearful that if I even, you know, raise the flag Mm -hmm. around, um, Hey, I'm just, I'm having a difficult time or I'm not having my best day. Mm -hmm. I I'm, I'm just not, not performing where I need to right now. I'm mentally, I'm distracted because whatever is going on in, in my personal life right now Mm -hmm. that you won't be embraced that you won't be embraced in that moment and said, oh, you know, I'm so sorry you're going through this. How can I help? Or what do you need right now? What would best serve you right now? Mm -hmm. Um, And instead being, well, you know, this is really not the place for that. This is really not the time for that. Or, you know, when you come into work, you really have to leave those things at home. And we try so hard to compartmentalize, but we find that we're really not as successful at compartmentalizing as we think that we are. No, and it actually causes more damage and can be re-traumatizing to an already traumatized person and brain. So, exactly, yeah. exactly. So just as you said, having that, 
having that environment, fostering that environment where you can really share, Hey, here's what's going on with me right now. And, and knowing that you have team members, you have leaders, you Mm -hmm. have administrators that are, you know, there to rally around you and work together with you Mm -hmm. in order to help you still, you know, hit all the mark, hit all the markers, hit all the targets. It's not that you're incapable it's that the system that's around you has not allowed for any, any, um, I guess, any sort of participation or any sort of presence that deviates from a one standard model. And so we have to move out of this one size fits all because one size does not. Yeah, I I agree. And so I'm curious, you mentioned the word, you know, um, moving from a lack mindset approach to an abundance mindset approach. And I talk a lot about that on my podcast as well, but you also mentioned inclusive mindset. So is, can you tell us a little bit, like dive a little more deeply for me into what that um, encompasses and how you incorporate that into your coaching and your leadership um, education? Absolutely. I, I, um, I just, I'm so drawn to that inclusive mindset because it, it really allows for um, for openness. It really allows for for you to see things. And this is this is how what it has meant for me. It really has allowed for me to see things through a different type of cultural lens mm-hmm. and coming okay. into situations with a level of just of humility and saying, "I'm here to learn." And please, and please, and please teach me. And I want to. I want other people to have that sense of that sense of belonging and to feel that they are included in the conversation. And inclusiveness is really about being intentional. It's a choice. We make a decision to include or to not include someone or something or a process into the discussion. And so this has just really allowed me to be so much more open. To, in to ensuring that everyone's voice is heard and everybody is part of the discussion so that we can expand upon what mm-hmm. what we're what we're starting with so we can make what what is already really good we can really make it great now and and so for me it's really been about following a framework right this is just this is what has been most helpful to me i, just, I probably after of years of trying to memorize algorithms, <laughs> and memorize, you know, cycles in, in medical school, a framework is really what <laughs> helps me stay on track. We're, we're boot camp trained to like, we operate with framework constantly, even outside of our profession, we do. Right. There's right. There's just always this abundance of information yeah. that, that that's coming at us. So, you know, especially if you had to get ready for like a big pharmacology test, like how are you going to yeah. be able to do get this back out. And so that having those, having those frameworks has always been very helpful for me. So, so for me, the inclusive leadership framework is really, I care. Okay. Um, and, and, you know, and that I really does stand for inclusion and, and that reminder that this is about being intentional and that this is making a choice to include others. And it will, it could be through very small moments that ultimately matter, but the difference that that could have for somebody else in, in that in that day in that small interaction that we have mm-hmm. and and the c is for courage the c is really for you know standing up to the status quo being willing to speak up use your voice challenge the status quo and to have those difficult conversations because this isn't always this is not always going to be comfortable and it's really getting comfortable with being uncomfortable with with you know actually letting somebody else know that, you know, Hey, maybe that comment is not the most appropriate comment. And here's another comment or, and even going beyond that and being able to say, here's how I felt when you made that comment, here's Mm -hmm. how I felt when you spoke over me during this meeting, or when you interrupted me during this meeting, or maybe when you took credit for my idea. Oh, that's one. (laughs) Yeah. Here's, here's how I felt. So that takes courage. Right. Like that is not easy to be able to do. And, you know, the- no, 
On the other hand, I want to say, though, it takes courage on the person receiving the feedback as well, like you said earlier, because it takes courage to get that feedback and and know that you might have said something that could have hurt someone's feelings unintentionally, of course, and to be able to take that feedback, it takes courage. That's so true. Because naturally we wanted to go into defensive mode. It's like, that's not what I meant. Oh, you misunderstood, you misinterpreted. And just to be able to receive feedback from somebody else that they're saying, Hey, you, you, what you did hurt me, what you, what you did crossed a line that you're right. That takes tremendous courage to be able to receive that. Yeah. And, take that in. and real know? quick, can I just ask yeah. you a mini role play just for a, just a bit where you show how a graceful way to receive feedback and what you could say as a response Oh, I had said to you, you know, you kind of, I felt a little, um, frustrated when you interrupted me in this meeting. And I just wanted you to know, um, how you would respond to that. I, I would respond by saying, I, I did not realize that I had done that. Mm. And can you, can you tell me more about when in the meeting did I, did I do that so that I can make that connection? Because I, I'm coming from a position of, I didn't realize that I did that. Mm-hmm. So please share with me, when did, when did I do that? Mm. And so that I can help refresh, you know, not even refresh, but I need to make the connection mm-hmm. about when that occurred. So mm-hmm. you, you need to acknowledge that you did it. So somebody is, te- you're telling me I interrupted you. Mm-hmm. I did not realize that I did that. Now that you brought that to my attention. Thank you, Katie. Mm-hmm. Thank you for bringing that to me for my, to my attention. And thank you for, for, for sharing you know, what that meant to mm-hmm. you for me to speak over you like that. And the next time I'm really going to watch myself. I'm really going to be more attentive to when I'm speaking over. And, and I would ask you, if I do that again, please let me know. Mm-hmm. That, that felt really good, Terry, that, that felt very authentic and that you care. And it just kind of reminds me that we're all human. And it reminds me that you weren't doing it intentionally to hurt me in any way. Um, And it's just about education, you know, and helping each other learn how to be more collaborative and open-minded. So thank you. Oh, no, thank you. I think that was great to just, yeah, I don't want to do, I want to take a sidebar and do that because I know, um, in my own coaching program, I work with Dr. Elsie Co. And, you know, when we role play, it's when I learn the most. And as a psychiatrist, I just love role playing. So thank you. I I think that's so smart. And I, and I hope that, you know, and I, what I love about role playing too, is it gives you a chance to practice. Yes. Because the, the very first time that you speak up may not go exactly how you envisioned it, right? Yes. It may, it actually may go totally go left. Like yes. you, you envisioned in your mind, I'm going to stand up. I'm going to be strong. I'm going to be confident. I'm going to really let somebody know how I feel not in an aggressive way, but you know, but I'm going to do so. in just in a very confident, my shoulders back, my chest out sort of manner. And then when it happens, your voice cracks, <laughs> you know, you say, <laughs> you say absolutely the opposite of, of what you intended to say. And so we're going to make mistakes. Yeah. We're going to make mistakes. And so having that opportunity to just kind of practice, to role play a little bit and, you know, sure we could have done this again and had it like, so just scripted and it was so precise, but let's be just very natural about how, because th- we want that sort of very natural Yes. flow of conversation um, as well, because that's, that's the humane part, right? That's what helps us really to connect. Yeah. Well, thank you. All right. So you're, you're describing eye care and I think we talked about intention and and courage Mm -hmm. and you want to continue on with that? Sure. Sure. So the A is for accountability and that is now, how are you holding yourself accountable and how are you going to help others hold themselves accountable. And so that's really about being able to empower, empower the voice and the decision-making, you know, how, what, what commitment are you now going, going to make that just in, even in the scenario that you and I uh, role-played about speaking over somebody or taking somebody's idea during, during a meeting, that accountability piece is, you know what, the next time I'm going to really pay attention 
in mm -hmm. the meeting to when I'm either taking somebody's idea or I'm speaking over somebody and I'm going to ask you to help me do it too. So I'm going to tell others that I'm working on this mm -hmm. and I want you all to kind of, you know, watch me. Mm -hmm. And so that if I am speaking over somebody, you're giving me a signal, you know, maybe you're, you're giving me an eye, you know, you're looking across me at the table or you're kind of tapping me, tapping my hand underneath the table and say, no, 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 Terry, you just spoke over so-and-so or no, that, that was, that was, you know, that was Katie's idea. So please be sure to acknowledge Katie. That's where that accountability piece really comes in, in that what we say that we are committing to, that mm -hmm. we are going to fulfill that. Mm -hmm. We're going to follow through. Awesome. Um, you know, the R is for the respect. It is really being effective in cross-cultural interactions for, for many individuals. And for, especially for us as, you know, in physicians, as physicians, when we go into the workplace, that is where we are most likely to engage with people who are different from us, people who have different cultural backgrounds, different religious uh, beliefs, practices, people of different ethnicities, people from all different walks of life in the workplace is where we are most likely to engage with people who are different from us. Mm -hmm. And so it's really about being able to be effective in those cross-cultural interactions mm -hmm. and, and being able to respect people's differences and honoring their differences. And so are we seeking out opportunities to experience culturally diverse environments? Because when we go home at the end of the day, we are going around people who are like us. And so how can we work well with individuals of different cultural backgrounds and how can we respect that? Right. And then the E is kind of a, a twofold, but it's that's where the empathy is that you and I talked about a little earlier and it's the equity because we're, we are really here to advance health equity. We are here to, here to remove barriers, uh, remove processes, yeah. just reimagine and redesign systems that are more inclusive and that allow for everybody to thrive and that allow for you know equitable care to be delivered. And so it's going to take a great deal of empathy, empathy for others, empathy for ourselves, throughout that process. And so we need to bring that empathy forward so that we can relate, connect, and inspire mm -hmm. if we truly want to achieve health equity. Absolutely. And um, so in care, you created that um, acronym and that um, the meanings behind um, that. Is that correct? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I'm like, ah, so much information is, is to talk about today. Um, but yeah, thank you, Terry, for that. So I care. And are you using any of those principles in your new role as vice president of DEIB at Dartmouth? Or how are you incorporating this knowledge and wisdom that you've gained over the years into your new role? I think those, these are principles that really are, are grounded you know, they're just the really baked into the the foundation of, of the work that that I really have the pleasure and the honor of of doing with 13,000 plus employees at, at Dartmouth Health, because this is not the work of any one individual. This is this is work that is integral to and for it to really succeed. It has to be integral for for all of us. I just have the great gift of being able to think about this 24 hours a day. You know, I just get to be able to wake up thinking about how can we foster a sense of belonging for our patients, our employees at Dartmouth Health, and then how can we expand that into the, the community of the Upper Valley that that we serve? So, I, you know, I just consider myself so so lucky and, and blessed to be able to, to do this every day. But this is... Um, this is the kind of mindset, that inclusive leadership mindset. This is exactly what we are working towards mm -hmm. integrating into, into all that we do. Wow. I, I, you know, I am so grateful for you, Terry. I'm so grateful I met you and I, 
I am so grateful that you are part of the team at Dartmouth. And this is really um, exciting that this is happening. I know there are some hospital organizations that are starting to integrate this into uh, their organizational well-being um, for the for the hospital system. So do you can you tell us anything about some future projects that you're working on at Dartmouth? Yeah, we are we are constantly working, right? At at Dartmouth. And so we are, um, we're in the throes of developing our strategic plan and then cascading that across our, across our system. And the, just prior to me starting our system, you know, Dartmouth health have really undergone a, a really robust assessment about where they were in their DEIB journey. And so I really applaud Dartmouth health for, taking an introspective look mm -hmm. to say where where are we and and where do we need to begin i you know it's with with something as big as this and something as critically important and you know, just really vital to business success we we want to jump right into doing we want to you know we have that action bias we're like let's go and let's and let's get going and i i just was really pleased and appreciative that Dartmouth was willing to take a, an introspective look and really willing to look inside and to be transparent about those areas that were, that were not as strong mm -hmm. and to, to share with our employees and get their input and ask mm -hmm. for, for their feedback about where we need to begin and where we need to make, make a difference. And, you know, one thing that is that really draw, drew me to the role was the fact that the word belonging was included in, mm -hmm. in the role because that, that said something very special to me. That said something very particular to me that Dartmouth was really going to focus on fostering a sense of belonging for its employees. And, you know, if I could just share a little bit of, of data with you around how this really connects to to the well-being piece and why why this is so important, I think, for us as as physicians and as you are somebody who has really been a champion of physician well-being and helping to advance that organizational awareness. You know, um, Cognizant and Microsoft completed a survey with over ten thousand respondents, okay. asking them, "In what ways do you think your employer would benefit the most by fostering a sense of belonging for its employees?" Okay. And using a five point Likert scale and with agree and somewhat agree, 91%, over 91% of respondents said it was important that they feel that they belong. Oh, wow. Okay. So when asked questions about, would you be more motivated to work, to do your work? That was rated the highest when you, and when you slice the data or disaggregate the data, by gender, by men and by, by women. So these were the two categories that this particular survey used. Being more motivated to do your work rated the highest. So looking so having, at- well, Having a sense of belonging, increased motivation to yes, work. Okay. Exactly. Wow. And so when you, when you connect all of these dots, just all of the, looking at all of the questions that they, that they asked around, more likelihood to stay with their current employer, mm -hmm. feeling more engaged, being more innovative as a work group, mm -hmm. overall performance improving. You can link all of this to show that by fostering a sense of belonging at work, mm -hmm. which over 91% of respondents said was important to them, mm -hmm. would lead employees to be more motivated, more likely to stay with their current employer, feel more engaged, take more pride in their work, be more innovative as a work team and improve overall performance, okay. right? That okay. is exactly what we're looking for. That's what you want as an organization. That's what you want as a company. Yes. And so did you come up with the title diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging? No, that title was already in place. That was a title that Dartmouth Health said they wanted their, you know, system vice president to have. And so that was that was the title that I received when when I was offered the position and I I love that that is the direction 
that we're taking because, you know, the bottom line is that fostering a sense of belonging significantly improves our overall engagement, our emotional well-being, mm -hmm. which translates into a more successful, more productive, more profitable, more profitable, right? <laughs> and that's, and, and, and that's what we want. Like that's the business case. That's our bottom line. That's the business case in the bottom line for a fostering a sense of belonging. You know, Terry, I really like this approach and I love that that's your title. Uh, this was new for me. I had not come across that before. So I don't know if there are any other, um, physician leaders out there that are considering um, that role. But um, this is, I just really think this encompasses all the different aspects and the, and the multiple layers and complexity of the inclusion mindset. I, I couldn't agree more. And I hope that more and more physicians are you know, going to develop their inclusive leadership muscle. Yeah. I, you know, I, um, there is so much potential in our collective voices. So I would, I, I hope that your, your audience is, is feeling a sense of empowerment, whatever position you're at, wherever level you are at, wherever you sit, look at your current sphere of influence. And what is the difference that you can make? Because you can make a difference. Because, you know, we're all leaders and we're all patients. And we're all in this together and together we're going to change our culture of medicine and make it a healthier culture and more inclusive culture. So I love that, Terry. And, you know, just for wrapping up, if I am a healthcare system leader, chief well-being officer, um, nursing leader, and I, and we don't really have anything in our organization looking at diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, where would we begin? Do you have any resources, articles, um, even if you're available uh, as a resource as well to where to begin in this process. I, I would love to connect with, with more organizational leaders about how to, how to start their journey. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, my contact information, I'm sure is probably going to be in, in your notes. So please uh, reach out if you, if you do have, have any questions, but where this work really begins is it starts within. Mm. This work truly starts within, and I, um, and that's where I would, I would advise if I was going to give anybody, you know, or any, any organization or any organizational leader, a, a piece of advice about where to start. It starts with you. Mm -hmm. It really starts with you as the individual and knowing that, um, medicine is still very hierarchical. Right. So the more you move up to the top, it starts to get more narrow. And there's uh one one voice that will probably overpower the majority because that person's in the most senior leadership position. But wherever you are, start to look within and say, what am I doing to intentionally include others who have been excluded before? And what is that one, one step that I could do? And maybe that's, as you and I role played earlier, it's not interrupting. It's not interrupting my female colleague. It's mm -hmm. not taking credit from, from my fem female colleague. It is looking around the room and saying, well, everybody in this room is somebody who is from a majority group mm -hmm. whose voice is not being heard in this discussion. And who do we need to ensure is part of this? So at an organizational level, there's a lot more that can be done, but that can even be done in an organizational looking within, taking that time to be really introspective and say, what are we doing to foster an environment, mm -hmm. include everybody, and then doing that at an individual level. That's where you have to start in order to know where are we going, where are we going to begin? You know, I love that, Terry, especially because I am a holistic psychiatrist and I believe in walking your talk. And if you are going to lead your health system or your medical group or whatever in your or you're a patient advocate, um, starting with yourself and doing the internal work makes a huge difference because it is a ripple effect. And as leaders, when we show up, and we are evolving and we are doing our own internal work. 
we, we are kind of in, in a very humble place at that point. And I think more open to suggestions and feedback because we're trying to learn and grow. And I, you know, just want to encourage everyone to keep this in mind. So thank you for that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Great advice. Um, well, everyone, you know, Terry, unfortunately we have to wrap up today. I feel like we have so much to discuss and this is such an important topic that I'm sure we'll be doing another podcast in the future, uh, to delve even deeper. Um, but I want to thank you so much for being a guest today. And, um, to our audience, I will, Terry will have her own bio page on my website. And also I'll be posting any information we talked about today, resources. And then if you have any questions, you'll have her information to reach out to. So thank I would be happy to come back anytime. It's been so much chatting, so much fun chatting with you. Yes. Thank you so much, Terry. And everyone, we hope that you have a great rest of your week. Thanks for tuning in.